Hey everyone. So I'm going to try and make this video quick. Uh, this is a video about my hobby that I've had for the last 10 years that I've put an enormous amount of research and resources into, as you can see. Uh, there's some of the books about it, but this uh, research that I've done is about a technology that this inventor uh, worked on from 1975 to 1998. We'll start with a couple of news stories here. At the top of our news here at 6 o'clock, an age-old dream becoming a reality. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his dune buggy. I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, then you use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Myers started working on this project four years ago. He's not a scientist. He isn't even a chemist. In fact, he never graduated from college. Myers was determined, he says, to design something to protect this country from oil embargoes. And we have calculated that if we take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Myers' invention. There is talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. A car that runs on water instead of gasoline. Can it be true? Well, inventor Stanley Meyer made an announcement today in Colorado Springs. He says he's come up with a device that will hook up to any engine and allow it to run on good old H2O. News 13's Kurt Goff tonight on the possible impact of the water fuel cell. Stanley Meyer says the answer to dependence on foreign oil lies all around us. In seawater, tap water, and rainwater. Any kind of H2O, he says, can power just about every type of engine. How? With the water fuel cell, it fits in the palm of his hand, but it could revolutionize the world. You're talking about a pollution-free, totally new source of energy, the voltage disassociation of water. The fuel cell converts water into a gas, hydrogen oxygen, which is released in the form of thermo-explosive energy. So the water fuel injector simply replaces the spark plug. We hook it to a hydrogen computer system, which regulates and meters the flow going into the injector. It processes the water in such a way to release its thermal explosive energy. The man who invented an engine that can run on water says he's been offered a billion dollars in cash by oil producing countries to sell his patent. So far, he hasn't sold. Environmental specialist Jan Porter talked to the inventor who thinks that the U.S. auto industry could produce cars that run on water now if they wanted to. We recently took a scientific delegation to witness Stan's work, to really evaluate it, and came back saying, this is one of the most important inventions of the century. Okay, so in that one video you saw, those are all condensed versions of the actual uh, news stories. You can look them all up on YouTube. Just search his name. But the one video they mentioned uh, the Pentagon being interested in the project and uh, Lieutenant Colonel flying down to uh, visit. There you can see his name was uh, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, I think Edward Parkinson was his name. So this was back in 1985, quite a while ago. I actually went through and filed a Freedom Information Act request uh, to the U.S. government on any information they had on the water fuel cell or Lieutenant Colonel Parkinson's visit. And they replied and said that they had no knowledge of any of it ever occurring. So that was uh, a little interesting. And if you go through forward in time to 1998, you'll find a story on him and what happened. This is out of the Columbus Dispatch in Columbus, Ohio, where he lived, or near where he lived. He lived in Grove City. You can still get on the Columbus Dispatch website and look this article up. So it says, after 20, more, 20 years of research and tinkering, it was time to celebrate. So him and his brother and two Belgian inventors raised glasses in the Cracker Barrel in Grove City, Ohio. 
goes on to read, he took a sip of cranberry juice, then grabbed his neck, bolted out the door, dropped to his knees, and vomited violently. I ran outside and asked him, what's wrong, his brother Stephen Meyer called. He said, they poisoned me. That was his dying declaration. That was the last thing he said. And then in that other uh, news article, you know, they said he was offered a billion dollars to sell his patents. A lot of people discredit Stan. They say he never did what he said he had done. And in some ways that's true, I believe. Uh, I'll say right off the bat, I don't believe in free energy. And a lot of people claim that this was a free energy device. I think it was just doing something that we hadn't discovered before. I think he discovered a phenomenon and that phenomenon is what gave him the faith to continue his work. Um, oh, I forgot what else I was going to mention about that. So he, he held over 60 patents at one point. And a lot of articles that he'd written, an actual book that he'd written on all the technology, some of his claims he made were pretty, uh, pretty out there. And, you know, a lot of scientists and engineers that heard his talks just completely ridiculed him because the claims were just so wild that they didn't believe him. And they had good good reason not to believe him because he didn't really show any proof. A lot of his claims, I believe, were just based on what he had seen in his own lab, uh, based on the measurements he had taken. They weren't actual things that he'd accomplished. So, here's a cell. This is a replication of one of his cells, a very good replication I had made by a guy named Adam from New Zealand. So, Adam, you are awesome. I don't think I could ever get this to work without this. And I haven't got it to work yet, but I haven't tested this out yet either. And these are my coils. There's two coils in here, actually four coils. Uh, they're separated two here and two here. Uh, I've got a picture of them and they if they work right they're going to give me a very high voltage low current output at a audio frequency and they're going to match the impedance of this cell. You can see they're shielded by an aluminum enclosure. There's what they look like on the inside and these cells are also shielded using Delrin which is actually a very good uh, shielding for radiation. Certain levels and frequencies of it. And there's a reason for that even though the circuit operates in the auto frequency range um, because if you get it to work correctly from the research I've done I believe that you'll produce very high frequency radiation and I do know someone who has gotten this to work and before I even mentioned that or talked about that, he told me it's the weirdest thing. Whenever I run this thing, even for 10 or 20 minutes, I get sicker than a dog. He said, headaches, nausea, just about to the point of vomiting. So I knew he was being exposed to radiation from it. And we'll just go on and show you. Here I've got an oscilloscope, obviously, some signal generators. My coils, a power supply over here had several different drive circuits that I've designed many coil designs over the years I can show you here's just a few of the coils that I've made and, and designed from hand a lot of calculations go into making those you can't just wind some coils on a uh, magnetic core and expect it to work I learned that the hard way and these ones all involved a lot of math. They weren't just winding coils. Uh, they, they were actual designs. And I'll show you my lab notes and my workbooks where you can see the math that I've done. Okay, these are just a few of the designs that I've done over the years. And this book is about half full, but it just goes on and on. And this is one of four notebooks that I have. Here's another. Something's got more in it. 
you can see. <laughs> and one more, and I think the first one I threw out because it was when I was first getting into this and it just turned out to be a lot of uh, junk information that I know now uh, that I don't need. So here are some of this is actually a lot of it is his papers and patents and copies of um, news articles and other things and then the rest of it are um, college research papers and uh, different research papers and uh, just basic knowledge of chemistry and physics and electrochemistry basically anything I could find that uh, has been related to what I've studied over the years. So you can see there's there's quite a bit of work here I've done. Uh, way too much to ever give up. And I hope that someday this will lead me to... You know, all I really want to do is see it work. And um, maybe write up a book on it. Explaining how it works and what it does. Hopefully in the future I will be able to work with some engineers. I really think that you can't understand this completely unless you are working at the laboratory level. There's far too much involved in this. There's another inventor before Stan um, that a lot of people actually believe, and I think uh, Stan actually copied his work, but this inventor talks about uh, an electrohydrodynamic effect in the cells and the cells producing phonons, which are sound waves, and the um, the effects actually changing the um, the angle of the water molecule. So typically it's 104 degrees. This guy claimed that it changed the the angle from 104 to 109 degrees and uh, split the water using phonons and all these different things. So it's really a complicated technology. Um, there appear to be several variables that all have to be matched and aligned in the correct way for this to work. And if it is working, if it was working, and I simply move my hand here, that would be enough interference to throw it out um, to prevent it from working, to throw it out of the uh, impedance match. So, lots of work, but I plan on uh, explaining the things that I've learned over the years, you know. Um, there's a lot of stuff about Stan that people just haven't gotten really into uh, deep research to understand. And I just hope to share that on my channel. And maybe some other people will be interested and uh, share what they know as well. So, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Take care.